I just uh, I wanted to um, suggest some applications that uh, that I'm aware of or that I envisage in the field of education um, from an experiential point of view. Um, integralism has been around for a while. Um, uh, I think that um, our age, that this age that we're entering into in relation to the rational, uh, for example, uh, could be called the integral age. And as I tried to suggest yesterday, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, this is a development. Uh, human consciousness and human societies have been on a, an arc of development for the last three or four hundred years, and a particular one. And there have been other similar arcs of development throughout history. So we can look at that as a, as a spiral also. And sometimes uh, some aspects of the human being come forward, and at other times they recede. Um, so it, it, there are many indications that we have entered into a cycle of human development known as the integral, the integral consciousness, the integral meme. Um, and in, in uh, 20th century, there were a number of philosophers that were very prominent, especially in the first part of the 20th century, who took a very strong, deliberate uh, position with respect to intuition. And they, uh, they wrote impressive philosophies about how the intuitive mind can grasp reality more integrally and, in, and uh, holistically. Uh, and so Jean Goetzer's study of uh, the history of consciousness as it is expressed through forms of art, especially throughout the known history of, of humanity, um, can identify, that perspective can identify different uh, types of consciousness that have manifested in a developmental way. And so then, then we get developmental psychology applied to society. The, the same kind of developmental psychology that was being applied to human development uh, in, the, in the early 20th century um, can and was applied to an understanding of social development in general. Um, and so we can, we can define a pattern of emergence of consciousness in human societies that roughly goes along the line of um, archaic and um, typo and conventional and rational and integral. And so we, we're beginning to see many signs of the emergence of the integral. And in uh, education, for example, um, in the last you know, 20, 20 or 30 years that I've been working in education, uh, we have seen um, a school that, was, that is quite strong in America known as Multiple Intelligences, which came out of Harvard uh, Project Zero, and I, I, one of my schools has worked, I, I was the director of a school that worked with uh, Project Zero and implemented uh, methodologies for educating students uh, with respect to the, the idea of multiple intelligences. And we can, we can superimpose a template on this paradigm which corresponds to the multiple intelligence template fairly closely. And that, that's a, a theory of uh, learning uh, that's based upon uh, cognitive studies. And uh, Howard Gardner is a great, very important cognitive psychologist at Harvard. And he identified uh, learning modalities that are predominant in individuals. So some, as Vladimir has mentioned, some individuals 
are um, more inclined to learn uh, visually, and some are more inclined to learn audibly, and some learn kinetically, some learn through social interactions. So the social types, some are mathematical and theoretical. Um, and so these, these learning modalities correspond very closely to the faculties. And then the question is, in education, how can we provide learning opportunities in a general learning environment that are um, deliberately geared towards this whole range of learning modalities instead of, and in the traditional way, everyone is supposed to learn more or less, more or less linearly and in terms of text. In most schools, that's what it is. It's about reading and writing, and uh, and mathematics, um, and so the, the you know the Roman Roman quadrivium um, is is not particularly addressed to the integral mind. Um, there is music, and there is mathematics, and there is logic, and um, physical physical development. So, Howard Gardner and the, and the Harvard School have produced uh, a methodology based upon a theory of multiple intelligences. And the goal in a school that uh, uh, implements that theory is to be sure that the students who learn visually have plenty of opportunities and are not required to just think linearly and mathematically. And uh, similarly, the schools that, the, the children that learn through social interactions and, and asserting them, their leadership and helping others uh, have plenty of opportunity to learn through those more intersocial types of relations. Um, students that learn mathematically and, and linearly, of course, will have plenty of opportunity to do that. But then, how do we, uh, the, the question that comes up in that context is, how do we enhance an integral learning so that the students who are inclined to learn in a linear way actually develop more intuitive skills, more interpersonal skills, um, learn to express themselves verbally um, because, who, you know, the students who are more inclined to play video games and to program better video games because they operate in code and they don't need to ever say anything uh, to anybody and every, everything is done through the uh, digital, digital world and more and more that, that becomes a problem. <laughs> but the, the interesting question then, um, or one of the interesting questions you know, that arises in that kind of problematic area is um, do we, do the teachers and educators know that these approaches have fundamental, essential roots in existence. That the faculty of speech is an important expression of consciousness. And the uh, relationships which take place socially or artistically uh, are fundamental expressions of our innermost being. And so not only are, are they um, approaches that correspond to learning modalities, which they are, but they are also necessary for the fulfillment uh, of the, the human being and, and the expression of the truth of existence. 
Do the teachers know that? <laughs> Do the cognitive psychologists know that? You know, how, how far in does the, does the concept of integralism actually go at this point? So here we can see that a study like this is it's not only uh, uh, recovering uh, a kind of uh, quite interesting and, and complex uh, system of understanding, metaphysical system maybe, but it's also relevant to an emerging human paradigm in life. And if, if we can um, utilize our, uh, our interests in education and in integralism and our interest in uh, yoga and higher consciousness to enhance the scope of integralism uh, in, in, in educational environments, then we're, we're likely to not only achieve the goals of educational methodology, which are to help everybody learn, uh, but we may also achieve the goal of bringing out in, in students their innermost possibilities in relation to the universe. Um, they may become integrally creative and expressive of the divine through social relations and art and science and um, psychology and philosophy. Uh, but this, this degree of uh, access to the integral, if we can sort of encapsulate it like that ontologically, uh, is not yet developed. Even in the ashram school, where there's another form of integralism, and here in Oroville, the, the form of integralism here is about the physical, the vital, the mental, and the spiritual, and how you know it's necessary to develop the physical through physical activities, and the vital through vital activities, and the mental through mental activities, and the, the spiritual through higher uh, yogic methods. But where is the actual integralism in that? It's actually a, a not particularly integral approach. Um, but it's known as integral education. And then we have the integralism of uh, Wilbur, and, and this is a psychological approach. He's a transpersonal psychologist and a developmental psychologist, and his main idea of the integral comes from phenomenology, I think, and it's about interiority and exteriority. So we, we capture this to some extent with the the subjective and the objective, and then he makes a chart which shows all of the things that fall on the subjective side and all of the things that fall on the objective side, and then there's a kind of series of, of circles um, that indicate the, the physical subjective objective, the vital subjective objective, the mental subjective objective, and um, and then one has to ask again the question, where is the integral in this? It's mainly a schematic which shows all the parts, but it doesn't necessarily integrate anything. Um, so integralism is, uh, let's see, there's one other uh, more conventional form in education. Uh, when you go into a classroom, even in India today, it's a very progressive educational system that has been adopted in India for the last eight years or so, known as continuous comprehensive evaluation. And comprehensive means the whole child. So teachers in schools in India today are supposed to be looking at their students, evaluating them, and helping them develop with respect to social, emotional, and mental qualities and capacities. And teachers are supposed to be uh, evaluating, and you know, if, if a teacher is giving students marks for something, that sends the message to the student that it's important. If you don't evaluate a student's social development, 
then the student is not likely to develop very much socially. Just like if you don't evaluate their mathematical development, then they're probably not going to do their math homework. You know, if they don't know that they're going to get a grade for it. Um, so this is behavioral psychology. But it works in all domains. So the schools in India today are supposed to be creating programs that are activity-based in which the student's social relations with other students can be evaluated. The student's emotional you know, relations, the ability of the student to listen to others, to honor what others have to say, to incorporate the ideas of others. These kinds of social and emotional skills are actually supposed to be evaluated in schools in India today. And that's even beyond what's happening in the multiple intelligences classrooms in America. Not that very many teachers are good at it, but the, the methodology is there. And then there's a, there's a criticism that uh, can be made of integralism in general, and that is that it's usually, I mean, in education I mean, it's, it's usually a methodology, and it very seldom does it include content. So the, the integral school is all about encouraging the development of all the parts of the being, but it doesn't know anything about history and philosophy and psychology and sociology and government and you know all of these domains of real important uh, activities because the whole focus is on the integral development of the person and not anymore on the domains of knowledge. So here's another problem of, for integration. That edu education is not just about the methodology that enhances the in individual's development. It's also about what is there, you know, what exists, what are those objects of awareness that we call society and government and uh, and mental health and environmental pollution. You know, we, we have to understand those things that exist at the same time that we need to understand them in a way that is holistic and integral. So in education, both of these, um, uh, the inner and the, the subjective and the objective, the, the approaches and the domains, these also have to be integrated. So uh, just for the, in terms of education, this uh, type of study has importance and it also has uh, a vast range of, of the possible applications. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> We don't have much time today, so we're trying to wind up by 3.30. Yeah, I have a question to Rod. Rod, you have been both of the 40 years studying servants, teaching mother's yoga, and you have been doing this yoga for 40 years. At the same time, you are also an entrepreneur and an educationist. You have been setting up schools both in Oroville and in the U.S. So I'm curious about what have you been, when you were setting up the schools, you have both the consciousness of integral knowledge and you have also skill sets of being an educationalist. What have you done, both in the U.S. and Europe, where you set up those schools? How those schools have been expressing those integral qualities, which is different than the integral school that you have been talking about? What, is, what are your learnings? Well, I, I can't tell you much about that. It's all very uh, arcane and secret. One of the things that I like to do is uh, open, open the student uh, to the importance of spoken language. And this is not something that happens um, in a very deliberate way, uh, very successfully in classrooms. In, in America today, there some, some importance is given to something called voice. And the teacher is supposed to be sure that the student sometimes expresses themselves. And that's called voice. They have their own voice. 
but, but in order to have their own voice, all they have to do is say, I like that, or I don't like that, uh, or uh, that was a good story. But with students in a classroom, and that it, it doesn't really matter what age, it can be young students or upper level students or us, ourselves, um, that if the student has an opportunity to read aloud and discuss character, character development in a story, for example, that student suddenly moves outside of themselves and outside of the student-teacher relationship and enters into a world that we call literature. But most students, because of the state of language and media and culture today, aren't going to easily enter into literature, period. Because everyone is visual now and everything is in movies and the quality of language is deteriorating rapidly. But it's an extremely important faculty. And, and the student cannot really become uh, a successful uh, participant in society, in, in science or in government or in art uh, or in anything without a, a well-developed language faculty. And so there are ways to stimulate the development of the language faculty. But in, in most classrooms that's not going to happen because the teacher themselves have, teachers haven't learned how to use their language faculty and all the importance of the two or three generations or ten generations has been on text. Uh, but it's actually very easy to open that door because it's the most fundamental human quality and ability, language, spoken language. And once you open that door, then you have a resonance with learning of all kinds. So that's, that's one of the things that I do. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, just a commentary or question if you want. Uh, what you were talking about, about integralism uh, between all the domains and all of this, uh, in my mind is coming one synonym, like um, uh, we are talking about a spiritual as well, like a synonym of integral. Make sense for you? talking about phenomenal and the... No, 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 when, when, uh, when you are expressing the point of view of integral education, you, maybe we miss the integral in all of these dom dom domains, in my mind becomes the idea integral and spiritual are synonymous. Okay, and you know, I think the word integral means integer, it means one. But this one, like in the poem that I read on the first day, is, is called by Sri Aurobindo, the million-bodied one. So the, the really spiritual is all of the forms that are expressed in existence. The problem is that the human mind tends to break all of that down into isolated uh, domains and approaches. So, yes, we could say that a truly integral approach would be a spiritual approach. The problem with that is that the term spirituality has a lot of connotations. So, one of the things that we're trying to do by this, maybe, if we can uh, assert that we're trying to do something, uh, is allow integ integral knowledge to be an expression of the one. I'll, I'll take one more question and then we'll move to closing. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, in your morning reflections, you briefly referred to Sri Aurobindo's epistemology. And one wonders whether there is the elaboration of what could be called Sri Aurobindo's epistemology. But about the integral is, 
that one key challenge in the integral vis-à-vis -vis the epistemology is to go beyond the limits of the epistemic and find ways of integral connection between the epistemic and the ontological. Absolutely. And uh, this also relates to two other quick queries without taking much time. You refer to both multiple intelligence and the phenomenological. And the limits of the phenomenological schemata in Ulba. But what could be a creative kind of breeze between the phenomenological and the integral approach. As in Husserl, the big inspiration in Husserl is also very, what he calls as the spiritual vocation. So if you could, uh, you know, reflect upon that. Well, I could. <laughs> Briefly, but I think I'll <laughs> <sign up. laughs> We can have a conversation about that. But thank you, that's a great point. If that's okay with you. It's uh, too big of a topic, but uh, I, I, I did, yesterday I, I spoke for an hour about philosophy. Um, and I, some people thought that that wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> but actually there was were, were just about everything was there that could be said, I think. Um, and the, to, um, to know the being of things, which is the phenomenological goal, the, the project, to step back from the epistemos and reconnect with the being of things, I think uh, can, can be facilitated by an integral epistemology. And the integral epistemology is very similar to, uh, uh, to the whole idea of deconstruction. You know, if, if, if we deconstruct science and, and art and music philosophically and psychologically and historically, we're taking some steps towards that grasping the being of those things that we're deconstructing. And the deconstruction is just a kind of more academic form of uh, phenomenology, in my view. Uh, so, yes, one is a means and the other is the end. Um, and they, they need to be seen together. That's what I would say. stage. <laughs> The state of consciousness being an integral one has uh, gone beyond that. Now you have to consider, or I have to consider, we all, that integral state of consciousness is about 1 to 2 percent. Yeah. And if you look at America, there are, you mentioned, Debsos, what do you call that? Yeah. Okay, Patrick, Mythic, Rational, yeah. the uh, that 40% or uh, 50% in America is still on the uh, mythic, on the metalist side. Well, in, in India, it's a bit more like 90%. It is 90%. <laughs> so the question is how do these 90% get to this integral? It's not necessary. The mother said it takes about 1,000 years. It's not necessary. Yeah, it's not. No. The, the idea of spiritual evolution is that a few can open the door to enormous change, and that enormous change will come upon others in spite of themselves. And one of the things that the mother said in, in the 70s was that the supermental being will make it possible for the human being to finally be itself. But it will not make the human be supermental. And so the, it's a principle of evolution. The, the higher evolution has to take place among the very, very few. Um, and and that, that influence will be so great. I mean, imagine the mother uh, existing in a hundred individuals on the earth. Um, and what an enormous difference that would make. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you knew her, but uh, 
but she was quite extraordinary. And, and you know, you can feel her, her energy from time to time in this environment. It just washes over everything, and it's very, very present. Um, so this, this is an indication, you know, it's a, as Sri Aurobindo said in Savitri, she is only uh, a prophecy and a hint. <laughs> so, um, so of what, you know, and then there are another 500 pages that tell you what that is. Um, so I don't think we need to worry about the mass. Um, if we see, first of all, if we see that it's all divine, then we worry about it much less. <laughs> you refer to the critical mass. The critical mass is 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 small. You know, I think uh, one one thousandth of one percent would be fine. <laughs> she told Satrim once when he was worried about the publication of his book. She said, "If ten people read it, it's enough. Don't worry." <laughs> and, and she meant really read it, you know. She didn't, she didn't mean just open the pages. Okay, well we, we did promise to end at half past three today, and uh, we're thereabouts. Um, so tomorrow we will have, um, we'll really be digging more deeply into, um, into applications of ethical carry on knowledge. Um, so we have a number of, of speakers, Natalia, who you've met, Ananta, um, uh, Anand Chaudhary, who is not here yet, Tong, who's sitting at the back, myself, all sharing different perspectives around application of the integral paradigm of knowledge from perspectives of science, uh, sociology, philosophy, psychology, music and poetry, business and society, and education. So, um, I think my, my request to all of you as you go away, you've had, you've had a lot of input and a lot of ideas around what this paradigm looks like. Um, as you're going through tonight and tomorrow morning, I think it's really valuable for you to be thinking about application. Thinking about application in your own life or around questions that you might have around application. There's some, you know, we're just going to look at a small number of domains, but maybe you can already find ways to uh, make our presentations as difficult as possible tomorrow. Um, with lots of good questions and there are also maybe wonderful things which you can add to enrich all of our understanding of what this application might look like. So thank you very much everybody. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you.